It's with great pleasure that I introduce this afternoon's Stir Talk, and I want to thank uh, Jean Poser um, for all her support during this um, interesting event, and Professor Moberly and uh, Molly and everybody who's um, helped put this together. So I'd like to invite everybody to please settle back, relax, have a cigar, you're going to go far. You'll know where that's coming from in just a minute. <laughs> Our speaker today is uh, Professor Franz uh, Vanderdunk, a rock star, I'm told, in the world of space law, um, be it commercial, leisure, military, or intelligence use of outer space. He's the one. He's the man. He's consulted and held various, um, uh, various positions with the European Union's Space Agency, the International Court of Justice, He's a big shot in this um, area of the law. He also consults with governments and private enterprises about the laws and international agreements regarding exploitation of space. The Law College is very lucky to have somebody of his stature on our faculty. He's a good fit. Professor von der Dunk became an expert in space law on a whim uh, at the inspiration of one of his mentors in law school. He's an avid fan of Amsterdam's, I would say, and you all would pronounce it, Ajax um, uh, soccer team. I'm told that he pronounces it Ajax, Ajax uh, soccer team. And I'm told that he'll often stay up all night to watch games live. He and his owls. He's very quick to point out that the team's home colors are the exact same colors as the Huskers. So that makes it okay. Professor Van der Dunk has impeccable taste in music. He's an avid Pink Floyd fan, the greatest rock band in history. And I'd say that with all uh, conviction. References to the band Bound in his writings feature prominently even on his business cards and his website. His fondness for Pink Floyd certainly inspired him to think outside the box and take a long view of the world at large. There's a real sense of poetry and destiny in the fact that a person and who is a native of one of the lowest elevation countries on the planet has his expertise in the law of outer space. Can you see the... <laughs> so here is Professor von der Dunk to tell us something about the latest developments in the world of commercial space travel. As Pink Floyd has said, I sometimes wonder, where do we go from here? It doesn't have to be like this. All we need to do is make sure that we keep talking. Thank you very much. Uh, am I, is the microphone working? I'm looking at our, okay. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, after the very veiled allusions to my musical preferences, you will understand that I'm only borrowing the title of Frank Sinatra's song and I'm going to play it here because that's a different style of music. Nothing bad about Frank Sinatra, but it's not my cup of tea actually. Um, I think I thought it was a good idea to start with a bit of audience participation and I want to see a show of hands. How many of you have done this, have taken a flight with a, a commuter aircraft within the United States? No surprise there, almost 100% score. How many of you have, excuse me, have done this, taken a wide body intercontinental flight between the United States and another continent? Still an impressive show of hands. But I think with the next question I will see no show of hands. <coughs> Who has ever done this? Who would like to do this? <laughs> <laughs> this. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is rocket science. <laughs> Who would like to do this? Ah, I got you. We'll come to back to whether how, how feasible this is. But this is a 
a vehicle developed by a U.S. corporation being developed right now as we speak. The corporation is called Xcore. The vehicle is Lynx, and they plan to fly passengers to the edge of outer space as close as as as, uh, as soon as 2040. And moreover, they are not the only game in town. This is the mothership of Virgin Galactic with underneath it a spaceship called Spaceship 2, which is dropped at an altitude of 55,000 feet and on its own account then moves into outer space for five minutes of weightlessness. Um, yet other technical and uh, operational designs are being developed as we speak. Blue Origin develops a suborbital spacecraft which looks a little bit like the Apollo spacecraft of old. This one, I'm not sure I would trust it to carry me to outer space, but it looks like another, yet another contraption built by Armadillo Aerospace, and it's called the Pixel Rocket. And finally, the Sierra Nevada Corporation is developing a Dream Chaser. Now, I spoke about your possible interest of actually doing that. Be aware that there are tickets for sale right now. And just to give you a comparison, Link in Chicago, this commuter aircraft is roughly 400 miles, and you can buy a ticket for as little as 250 US dollars, probably even less if you're lucky and quick. Link in Tokyo is some 6,000 miles, and you can fly there and back for about 1,500 US dollars. Link in outer space is only 62.5 miles. <laughs> <laughs> Ticket price doesn't reflect that. The two serious <laughs> operators so far in business, or close to being in business, offer a price of $200,000, that's Virgin Galactic, uh, or 95,000 euros, which is a Space Expedition Corporation using the links from Curacao. 95,000 euros, by the way, is something like 135,000 US dollars in current in current uh, uh, currency exchanges. There is a small problem, however. Do we need a license to do that? We do. Really? Why? There have been, by now, over 500 people have actually visited into outer space. Did any one of them have a license? No. Officer, let me show you something. Darkening this and I hope the sun gets. ventured into outer space so far was what, that they were astronauts sent by the US and USSR governments and then the French and European and <coughs> Chinese and Japanese governments into outer space. We're speaking about government employees on government spacecraft paid for by the taxpayer. And there is this outer space treaty which provides that including the moon, outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies shall be free for exploration and used by all States doesn't mention anyone else, so it is the state which needs to provide the license for anyone else to go out there without discrimination of any kind, on the basis of equality and in accordance with international law, and there shall be free access to all areas of celestial life. But you still need a license. This treaty, by the way, is ratified by the United States, 
by the Soviet Union at the time, now Russia, and by all other important spacefaring countries. But things are changing. And I'm going to show you another short bit. which uh, uses a US vehicle to launch from Curaçao. Who is the one to, launch his, to, to license those flights? Which requirements should we list for a license? Which requirements should we list for the crew? Should we require them to fly like a pilot? This is a different technology. Or should we give them an astronaut training like the 520 something astronauts that so far have been in outer space? What about the space flight participants? Virgin Galactic itself currently has a policy by which it refuses anyone with a heart or coronary problem, pregnant women and those 16 years or younger because of the um, radiation dangers. But is that something we should implement by way of regulation? And what about the vehicle? Are we talking about an aircraft here? Or are we talking about a small version of the space shuttle? How shall we deal with that? And what are the international ramifications? I spoke about the United States and Curaçao, but Sweden is in the game. United Arab Emirates may be in the game. Singapore and others may be in the game. And what if, in case something goes wrong, by the way, I took obviously an aircraft crash because fortunately there are no spacecraft crashes yet, at least not of private spacecraft, but the question remains the same. Who is responsible? Who is liable? Who has to pay for the damage, either to the passengers or to the people on the ground? and who exercises jurisdiction over such claims. And then a specific US problem. What happens if various individual US states are trying to make themselves more beautiful for the operators, are trying to <coughs> offer them a complete waiver of liability towards the passengers because they want these operators to fly from California, Colorado, Virginia, New Mexico, etc. <coughs> and finally, what happens, what changes if we move from what is effectively just a sophisticated bungee jump? You go up <laughs> to 110 kilometers and within half an hour you come down, hopefully safely. You don't go anywhere really. But when we change that and we move to a true flight from the United States to Tokyo, using outer space you can cut down the travel time from 12 hours to 90 minutes. Now that is something, in particular of course if the price is dropped. I want to leave it at that because I want to 
stay within my 15 minutes, of course, but I'm open, obviously, to questions. Thank you very much.